In this session, I want to deal with sacrifice as a very important habit of successful supplicants. And uh, by sacrifice, I mean a voluntary loss, injury or disadvantage that is suffered for something else or someone else. And uh, sacrifice is a significant characteristic of successful supplicants. Now I turn your attention to 2 Kings chapter 3 and the narrative is basically about three kings, uh, the king of Israel, the king uh, of Edom and, uh, and the king of Judah waging war on Misha, the king of Moab, because he failed to pay his taxes. And uh, Elisha prophet, prophesied over the tripartite alliance that they would have a resounding victory over the Moabite king and his followers. So the Bible tells us in 2 Kings chapter uh, 3 verse 24 that uh, when they came, when the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them, but they went forward smiting the Moabites even in the country, and they beat down the cities, and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it, and they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kirashereth left they the stones thereof. Continues in verse 26, when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his place and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall and there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. Now, if you read the chapter, Elisha prophesied a resounding victory over the Moabites. And indeed, the alliance was winning. And when the king of Moab saw that the odds was against him, he took his eldest son that would have ruled in his place and offered him as a burnt offering on the wall. The horrific incident uh, either disgusted or terrified the Israelites so that the attack was aborted. It is believed that the Moabite king was following the tradition of his fathers in sacrificing to his god Chemosh, or that he was trying to do what Abraham did. Notice as you read 2 Kings chapter 3, the sacrifice changed the atmosphere of the battle, even impeding the complete fulfillment of Elisha's prophecy. Now, pagans recognized the value of sacrifices. Sacrifices were deeply entrenched in Hebrew culture and sacrifices were an integral part of priestly function. Now, I just quickly want to review the priestly functions of believers and Old Testament priests as types and shadows of the reality of the functions in New Testament priests. Sons of God, all sons of God are priests, 1 Peter 2, 9, and they are created for good works, Ephesians 2, 10, and these good works are called the righteous acts of the saints, Revelation 19, 8. And through these good works, we serve God acceptably with reverence and fear. 
Now, some of these functions are very important uh, to understand, but we will not have the time to go through all of them. I'll just mention uh, uh, some of them. And these priestly functions are the functions of all New Testament priests or New Testament sons of God. The first function is preservation. The New Testament priests, the royal priesthood, is referred to as the salt of the earth. And salt is a preservative, and through our righteous acts, through our good works, we preserve humankind. Secondly, when there is too much of salt, everyone notices. When there is too little salt, everyone notices. But when it is just right, no one notices. We must make the difference without being noticed. The Bible says, let your lights shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Salt was also used as a fertilizer to announce the growth of plants. We are to announce the growth of others through our deeds. And all these functions uh, help us to represent God practically to the world. And these functions are our responsibility to humankind, taking care of the orphans, the widows, the elderly, uh, our neighbors, our parents, the poor, the weak and the oppressed. And uh, these functions are symbolically typified by the candlestick in the holy place of the tabernacle. Just as the Old Testament priest represented God to the world, we represent God to the world through these good works. Secondly, as New Covenant priests, we have the function of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5.18 Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, Matthew 5.23 declares, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift therefore there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. In the Old Testament, priests supervised the tabernacle and temple buildings and undertook the necessary repairs. We as a royal priesthood are to repair the body through the ministry of reconciliation. The next important function is intercession or prayer. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying with all prayers and supplications in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Pray without ceasing. And as you know, the Old Testament priests burned incense to the Lord in the tabernacle and this was typical of the intercession of the believers today. And if you want to go further, the golden altar of incense typifies the ministry of prayer and intercession. The next important function of the New Testament priest is evangelism. Acts 1.8 you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In Leviticus 14, the, the priests purified those who recovered from leprosy, restoring them to the community. 
This typifies the evangelistic work of the royal priest in bringing sinners into the kingdom of God through the witness of the gospel. This ministry was also typified by the ministry of the high priest at the mercy seat in reconciling man with God. Through evangelism, we reconcile uh, men with God. Now, the next important function is sacrifices. 1 Peter 2, 5. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now in the Old Testament, the priest also offered sacrifices to God and the brazen altar was the place of sacrifice. Now I'll talk more about this a little later. And the next important function is teaching. The Old Testament priest taught, the New Covenant priest must also teach. He must educate by imparting knowledge. He must uh, nurture through instruction, uh, provisions and discipline. He must train. Uh, this is instruction with practice. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Believers are called to teach male and female. Um, Old Testament priests were actually guardians of the law and covenants. They taught the people and were consulted for the will of God through the Urim and the Thummim. The next important function of the priest is to support, strengthen, and to edify. Let me read some scriptures for you. Romans 14, 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and things by which one may edify another. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Now, Old Testament priests morally supported the people in times of battle. The ministry of edification is typified by the table of showbread in the tabernacle of Moses. And the table of showbread is a place of fellowship where one is able to strengthen another. Now, if you look at these functions, preservation, reconciliation, evangelism, intercession, um, sacrifices, teaching, strengthening and supporting. All these functions that the Old Testament priests did with reference to the tabernacle were shadows and types of functions that ought to be manifested in the New Testament royal priesthood. All believers are priests. Two of the important functions of the priests were intercession and sacrifices. Now, here's the problem. Many believers today offer incense on empty altars. That means they pray without any sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice, but obedience always involves some kind of sacrifice. Now, if you look at, I'll just give you two examples of prayers and sacrifice. Elijah on Mount Carmel, when confronted with the prophets of Baal and Asherah, the Bible tells us in 1 Kings 18.36, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. 
Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned the hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Elijah did not just pray. He prayed at the time of the evening sacrifice and God answered with fire. Let's look at another example, Solomon. Solomon, the Bible tells us, offered a multitude of sacrifices in his journey to the temple in Mount Moriah. Second Chronicles 5, 6 tells us also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen which could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Today people just want to pray and that's so cheap there is no sacrifice associated with their prayers. When you read 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and move on to verse 12, the Bible says, And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hand. And when Solomon prayed, you can read the, that old chapter. The Bible tells us in Chapter 7, verse 1. And when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The big problem is you can just read that one verse and think that because Solomon raised his hand and prayed, that the glory fell. But there was a build-up to the success of that prayer. The Bible tells us that he offered sacrifices that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. The reason why we have many failures in prayer today is because believers are offering incense on empty altars. There are no sacrifices. Sacrifices helps the believer to break through into new levels. It releases power, miracles, revelation. Look at what Jesus promised in Luke 18 verse 29. So he said to them, as shortly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. We shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come everlasting life. So the promise is not only everlasting life. Jesus said you will receive many times more in this present time for the sacrifices you make. Let's examine some sacrifices. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham received the revelation of Jehovah Jireh only after his attempted sacrifice of Isaac. The widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings chapter 17, 10 to 16 experiences the miracle of multiplication of resources after she makes the sacrifice of releasing the first portion to the prophet. Jonah's breakthrough came after he mentions the sacrifice of thanksgiving. You know the story the fish then vomited Jonah onto dry land. 
In Judges chapter 20, you read the battle between Israel and the Benjamites. They had a valid reason for going against the Benjamites. The Benjamites were harboring criminals. They were harboring people who had raped the Levite's concubine. And so the Levite presented his petition to the nation and Israel declared war on the Benjamites. They had a valid reason for going to war. They even outnumbered the Benjamites and they received a prophetic word to go into battle against the Benjamites. The first time they went, they lost. Second time they went, they lost again. The third time they decided to follow the due protocol and offer the sacrifices, the burnt offerings, the peace offerings, and then only were they victorious in battle. Even at Mizpah, when the Philistines were coming against the Israelites, Samuel offered a suckling lamb as a sacrifice before he prayed. Jehoshaphat went into battle against the Ammonites, Moabites, and the people of Mount Seir with a sacrifice of praise. In Acts chapter 12, the Bible says in verse 5, Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God for him. This was about seven days of prayer by the church. This was a sacrificial prayer. In Mark chapter 5, in verse 20, verses 25 to 34, we read of the woman with the issue of blood. Indeed, she made phenomenal sacrifices. She, she broke the law because she was an unclean woman. She, she touched the hem of Jesus' garment and as an unclean woman, that again was a violation. She was physically incapacitated but she made the sacrifice of going to meet with Jesus and it took a great risk by by going into the crowd as a weak and a frail woman all those sacrifices and then when she came near to Jesus Jairus the ruler of the synagogue was standing next to Jesus and he could have authorized a stoning the woman made significant sacrifices to come to Jesus and she received a healing. We read in 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar at Mount Gibeah. And at that location, he accessed God. And it was an inaccurate location because the Ark of the Covenant was no longer at Mount Gibeah. Solomon went to Mount Gibeah where there was no Ark of the Covenant and offered sacrifices, the thousand sacrifices. He accessed God from an inaccurate location because of his sacrifice. Blind Bartimaeus made a great sacrifice by throwing away his garment, if you know, bit of the history that that garment was given to him by the authorities to prove that he was legitimately blind. And when he heard Jesus calling, he took all of the garment and threw it away. As a, and what a risk to take. What a sacrifice. And Bartimaeus received his healing. Jacob in Uncle Laban's house. This is what Jacob says in Genesis chapter 30, verse 33. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. Jacob's righteousness was the sacrifice he made in Uncle Laban's house to labor for 20 years. And you can read this in Genesis 30 and, and 31. And of course, you cannot leave this subject without considering 
the sacrifices of Christ is kenosis. Philippians 2 6 who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God here it is but made himself of no reputation what a sacrifice taking the form of a bond servant coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. By virtue of his sacrifice, Jesus is exalted. Even if you consider his sacrificial death, Matthew 27, 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to to bottom, his sacrifice on the cross released so much of power that the veil was torn in two, the Old Testament temple becoming obsolete, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. At his sacrificial death, resurrection power was released. Earth quaked, rocks were split, veil torn into, so many things happen. And there is great power in sacrifice. Now let us consider the different kinds of sacrifices. First sacrifice is brokenness. The Bible says in Psalms 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. And the word contrite is the word dakar, and it means to be crushed. It speaks of being crushed by the weight of remorse and repentance. That is a sacrifice. The prodigal was crushed by his remorse when he realized the errors of his way. Even in Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, Daniel 9, all the nine chapters, Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel, you see the weight of the remorse, the crushing, and that is a sacrifice. Even Josiah, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 34 verse 19, it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law, that he tore his clothes, crushed by the weight of repentance. And that's what brokenness is. Second sacrifice is thanksgiving or appreciation. Psalms 107, 22, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. I also already mentioned Jonah's sacrifice of thanksgiving. Jesus thanked Father before the resurrection of Lazarus. Thanksgiving is a sacrifice. Celebration is a sacrifice. Uh, let me read this to you. Psalms 27 verse 6. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Now the word joy, there is the word teruah, and teruah is a shout of joy, a shout of joy. It's uh, like the way they shouted when they came to the walls of Jericho. And uh, teruah is celebration of joy, and it's called a sacrifice. Remember, they had to shout before the walls came down. That's a sacrifice. And for us, that shouting is our rejoicing. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. The next sacrifice is the lifting up of our hands. Psalms 141 verse 2. Let my prayer be set before you as incense the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. 
Intercession is another sacrifice and uh, intercession means petition made on behalf of another. Just like in Acts chapter 12, sacrificing your time to pray for someone else. Faith is also called a sacrifice and I dealt with the woman with the issue of blood and blind Bartimaeus. Philippians 2.17, this is what Paul says, and yes, and yes, if I am being offered out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Integrity and righteousness are sacrifices. Psalms 4, 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. You recall Jacob in Uncle Laban's house and Paul's uh, and David's walk before Saul. And now he talks about his own righteousness that delivered him in Psalms 18. Consecration is another sacrifice. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, only acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And we recall Daniel and Joseph, the consecrated lifestyles. Now, exaltation and praise is another sacrifice. Hebrews 13, 15, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. And lastly, sharing and giving are sacrifices. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 16, do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And in Philippians 4, 18, Paul commending the Philippians, thanking them for Epaphroditus, uh, the things that had, he had sent to him, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. And this would include all financial sacrifices, special offerings and first fruits. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your possessions. That's your tithe. Uh, the, the tithe of all that had come into your account and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Your first fruit is your first and the best and it should be sacrificial. Tithe is not a sacrifice. You're basically returning what belongs to the Lord. In Philippians 4.19, Paul writing to the Philippian church after they had given so magnanimously. And you recall the Macedonian church who gave beyond their ability. And Paul commending them and saying to them, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And when you give your sacrifice, give it cheerfully. Let me read this to you in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And listen to this, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. When you give cheerfully, when you give sacrificially, all grace will abound to you so that you will always have all sufficiency in all things for every good work. What a promise, what a promise. I briefly want to talk to you about the sacrificial person. When the Bible says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much and the righteous man is a sacrificial person. When you look at Abraham, 
Abraham's life was filled with sacrifices from the time God had called him. He had to leave behind his familiar geographical location. He had to leave behind his relatives and friends. He had to leave behind his moon god. Tremendous sacrifice to move with the purposes of God. And then he went to Egypt and became very wealthy. And, uh, and then the Bible says in Genesis 13, then Abraham went up from Egypt means he left Egypt. Uh, he did not stay at that place, even though he prospered in Egypt. He was able to sacrifice Egypt. And for us, that is sacrificing this world and its system, separating from the world, overcoming the world, refusing to conform to the world, dying to the world. All of those issues are so important. And then we see Abraham making a great sacrifice in the issue of Lot when he gives Lot first choice of land. Again, what is sacrifice? And then Abraham sacrificing all the, the wealth, the spoils of battle. When he went to rescue Lot, he gave 10% uh, to, to Melchizedek and the remains he distributed to everyone else. Uh, Abraham basically sacrificed his love for money. And then Abraham leaves behind Agar and Ishmael at the command of the Lord. Again, we see his tremendous grace of sacrifice in that he is able to excise inaccurate relationships. And then we come to Genesis 22, where Abraham, in God's eyes, sacrificed Isaac. And it, uh, it is at that point that he receives the revelation of God as Jehovah Jireh. The reason is because Abraham don't just consider the sacrifice of Isaac, consider all his sacrifices up to that point. And we see that Abraham was a very sacrificial man and how God intervened in his life and gave him a son in his old age. Even David was very sacrificial. He went alone against Goliath. He denied himself a premature ascent to the throne. He could have killed Saul Given the opportunity, when Saul and him were alone in the cave, he could have killed him and ascended to the throne. But he denied himself a premature ascent to the throne. We also see his sacrifice when he took care of the Egyptian lying on the wayside. And that would have placed his family, his kidnapped family in jeopardy, but he made a sacrifice. And then the famous issue of buying the threshing floor of Arona, although it was offered to him for free. But David indeed was a man of great sacrifices. Paul, the Apostle Paul, also a man of great sacrifice. Philippians 3, 7. What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Indeed, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus for whom I suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Colossians 1 24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. 2 Corinthians 4 12, so then death is walking in us, but life in you. 1 Corinthians 4 12, and we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. And in Philippians 2.17, yes, if I am being offered out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So we can see that Abraham, David, Paul, all of them were highly sacrificial servants of the Lord. And sacrifice is an integral part of our Christian walk. 
And if we want to, f- to experience answers to our prayers, our lives must be filled with sacrifices. We cannot be praying from empty altars. I urge you to consider what kind of sacrifices have you made? Brokenness, thanksgiving, celebration of joy, terror, raised hands, integrity, faith, intercession, consecration, praise, and of course, giving. How much have you given this year to the Lord? Was it sacrificial? Or was it just the returning of the tithe, that which belonged to the Lord? I was at a meeting in a tent crusade uh, many years ago, and it began to rain very heavily. And uh, at that moment, the evangelist commanded the rain to stop. And I was so surprised as a young man, the rain stopped immediately. Everyone was awestruck. And this uh, incident is indelibly written in my mind. That this evangelist had such command over the rain. It's only later that I learned of his immense sacrifices for the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of my friends who is late had one of the greatest gifts of healing that I had ever seen. He would pray for the sick and they would always recover. He would go into hospitals and pray, even in ICU, and people would recover. His church was filled with with people that had recovered after he had prayed. And I came to know that his success was the great sacrifices that he he had made during his lifetime for the ministry. In fact, he silently invested his entire pension and resources into the kingdom when no one else was prepared to give. I have been in big budget conferences and have seen God move powerfully because the host of that meeting was extremely generous and sacrificial. Maybe this is the missing dimension in your prayer life. You could be meeting with other pastors and having prayer concerts and there are no movements. And the reason is because there's no sacrifice. If pastors want to see city change, if they want to see God move in an unprecedented way, the pastors must make big sacrifices in their churches for the kingdom of God. I urge you to consider this message and factor sacrifice as an important habit in your life. God bless you and take care in Jesus' name. Amen.